Hey everybody, this is Mitch. I'm going to quickly go over a video with you guys. Um, kind of show you some features in Alaska first about uh, my theory of how the Grand Canyon was formed and the catalyst that formed it. <clears throat> so, here we go. Um, just going to show you some features here. Um, this is an inland bay uh, in Alaska. Um, as you can see, there's some glaciers that are moving through here. Um, it's kind of well defined. The glaciers move along just like road graders that push snow and ice um, along a lowest path of resistance until it finds water and then that's the life of a glacier. Um, they tend to uh, join, meet, kind of like a, like a river but they're solid. Um, there's no rhyme or reason to how they work. They just, they, they're just, they just follow basically gravity to the lowest point. Um, as you can see they mix and they meander together but they all push to the lowest point they can find. Um, and they, as, as they do that they ch chunk out huge portions of earth as they go along and pushing what, you know, the ice into like I said the lowest point they can find. It's kind of a jerking motion too as well. It's pretty well defined. They, you can see where they stop, they push a little further, stop. It's kind of a jerking motion is what they do. Um, <clears throat> here's what a deposit of glaciation will look like. It looks almost like a, a delta almost, but they're more rounded. <clears throat> they just just because it's such a slow process, they just push and then stop, push and stop. And it gives it a, almost a terraced effect here. But it's pretty well defined because it's rounded. That's the difference between that and an alluvial fan or a delta. Um, and then right over here, I was just going to show you, um, like when glaciers move along into an inlet, they'll actually um, calve and then push huge chunks of ice into the water and therefore when it does that you can imagine that the wave patterns would be quite big <clears throat> and when they do hit like a coastal area you can kind of see right here what happens the waves come up on the side of the hill remove all the vegetation drag it back out into the water It's like a big bathtub. It just sloshes and then goes back out to the water. Um, clearly evident what happened there. <clears throat> those are some of the processes I want to show you when I'm talking about the Grand Canyon now. Um, basically my theory is everything in orange right here was underwater. <clears throat> um, there was plenty of evidence of glaciation here. Same process as I was showing you up in Alaska. You can kind of see where it stops and starts and it has that jerky motion. This huge valley right here was all part of a gigantic glacier. There's where they meandered together like I was showing you up in Alaska. going to the lowest point. There it goes. And subsequently filling this basin with water when they started to melt. So we got this huge basin which consists of this area right here. Orange, orange, orange. Filled with water. It's a lot of water right there, folks. And, as you can see, it, it was quite a substantial lake at one point. Um, now I'm going to show you some features along the way. Here is where the Grand Canyon actually broke through. The Kaibab Plateau. And you can see the tiny Colorado River down here. 
that just doesn't make sense to me because look at how the water had to have been 20 miles wide when it came through to create such a chasm in the earth so let me show you a couple features here okay you can see some volcanic activity along here the northern Arizona is full of volcanoes and uh, quite quite a bit of activity back uh, probably 10,000 years ago. This is kind of a curious feature here. You can kind of see this red mark that defines the edge of the waterline. Um, and it almost looks like something sloshed. You can see where everything was pushed forward. The bottom of the lake even was pushed forward in a gigantic wave action. So what, whatever created that must have been quite big, and I have the catalyst for that. Um, the red would have been caused by the lava flowing right into the, the lake itself. Right here you can see a lava flow. It looks pretty normal all the way across, how you'd figure a normal lava flow would look. But the interesting thing is, as soon as you get to where the water line is, which is this red declination here. Look at how the lava is deformed right here. As if it was cooled suddenly by water. Because it doesn't look like that back here at all. Normal lava flow on the edges. You don't see any of that deformation that you see right here. It's pretty defined. Okay, and then right along here was where the water was pushing forward. And I think the, the red was actually caused by the iron flowing into the water <clears throat> and settling on the bottom of the lake. Um, but then it looks like it actually got sloshed right here. Like something gigantic pushed waves of this stuff to deform the edge of the lake. And I'm going to get to that here in a second. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something on the other side of the Grand Canyon. Put it in perspective. There's the canyon. And right here, right where the, the break would have been, there was evidence of huge waves hitting the side of this hill. Just as you imagine a wave pattern would look. But those are gigantic waves. Okay, bring it back out. And I'm going to show you some uh, one more feature before we get into the my hypothesis. Right here. <clears throat> Remember I was showing you how a glacier looks when it melts and then pushes to the lowest point? Which is, this is kind of odd just because there's the little Colorado. Then you got all this dirt and soil being pushed out into the center. And then it just flows out. Where, what caused this water to flow this way? Unless it was a giant chunk of ice that was just sitting there melting. Um, <clears throat> it might have been in the lake when it melted or when it broke through at the Grand Canyon. But right here is a curious feature. Meteor Crater. It sits, what I've determined with another map, 550 feet below what would have been the edge of this lake. <clears throat> so when this thing hit, it hit in 550 feet of water, so you can imagine the tsunami, tsunami that it created. So, you would imagine there would be giant wave actions really close to where the edge of this water is. Well, remember what I was showing you in that bay? Those slosh marks on the side of hills? Look at this. Quite curious, because the edge of vegetation would have been the edge of the lake. Look how far these things went up. 
that sloshed all the way through there, filled these little basins, filled that, yeah, perforations up there, right there, right there, right there, huge, huge wave, just like you'd imagine if a meteor hit a body of water, same principle here. So when it did when it did break through, it, it went to the lowest point. So those waves rebounded from this side of the lake and then were magnified and pushed this way. <clears throat> and then when those these waves actually hit, there's where those slash marks are again with the red. Big, big like that would have been the bottom of the lake. All this soil will, <clears throat> and sediment would have been on the bottom of the lake, but because of the giant wave action that hit here, it pushed it all up on the what would have been the coastline of this lake. And then when it did break free, it went to the lowest point, which would have been right there. I mean, we even got the slash marks here. Look at this. It went, it went up and over right here and filled this little basin with water. And then it probably drained back out. It removed all the vegetation right there. And those are those giant waves I was showing you earlier caused by the meteor. Hence, it flowed through at the lowest point in the Kaibab Plateau. And then, subsequently, the water, once it started draining down to the very bottom of the lake, it would have cut channels into it, just like we see here. Um, these would have been giant waterfalls at one time. So we got the Little Colorado, which flows this way, and the Colorado River, which flows that way. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, this is this is just my interpretation of what I'm seeing here. Um, but if you look at the soil, even look how it just flows. The soil just is like sh getting sucked to the lowest points, as you can imagine. Like if you pulled the plug out of a bathtub everything would flow in a general direction. That's kind of what we're seeing here. The lowest point being the Little Colorado, so everything would have been flowing this direction. So you can see the streaking in the, in the land right here. It's not caused by wind, it's caused by the water rushing to a lowest point. But and then all the soil would have been pushed and have followed the Colorado down to this point and flowed right into the Gulf of Cortez. Um, this is the tiny Colorado River Delta today, but look at all that sand out there that would have been pushed out by that break in the Kaibab Plateau. So there's your evidence of where all the soil went from all this water that sat in this orange basin. That's my uh, hypothesis in a nutshell. There's a couple features here that are also kind of interesting while I've got a minute here. Um, <clears throat> this has the shape of a impact crater right here. I don't know if you can see it. It's a circle right here. This is old, but that is a giant crater pattern right there. To put it in perspective, here's Meteor Crater, this little speck, which is a mile across. This thing right here is probably 100, 100 miles across. But that's my video in a nutshell. I hope you all enjoy it. If you do, like it, subscribe to my page. This is Mitch. Have a good day.